Good morning. The open meeting of the Federal Election Commission for Thursday, April 11th, 2019 will come to order. Sorry for the slight delay. Um, we have a very interesting agenda. Agenda note, um, the item three on the agenda, draft advisory opinion 2018-13. Um, we're going to not discuss that today. Um, the commission had put out uh, a new draft response to that AO, I think, yesterday. Uh, and the requester wanted uh, an opportunity to review that and perhaps provide comments on it, which is perfectly reasonable. So we expect to take that up at the next meeting. The first item on the agenda is Draft Advisory Opinion 2018-12, Defending Digital Campaigns, Inc., um, by uh, some old friends of the commission, Mark Elias and Michael Toner, former commissioner. Welcome back. Actually, I shouldn't say welcome back because you've probably never been to this building. I know, a whole new fancy conference room. I bet you're almost sorry you left. Almost. Um, <laughs> we have, um, we, we have a uh, large group of people who have come uh, to engage with us on this, and I invite you to come to the table, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you. Yes, actually, we should do the minutes first. While you're getting settled, we'll do the minutes. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move approval of the minutes for the meeting on March 28, 2000. And uh, assuming that's 19, it says 18 on there, but I'm going to assume that it's, it's 19. 19. And uh, that's mm -hmm. set forth in agenda document number 19-12-A. Vice Chairman has moved approval of the minutes uh, as set forth in agenda document 19-12-A. Any discussion on the motion? If not, I will call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 And the motion passes unanimously. Yeah, quite a, yeah we have um, another uh, preliminary motion, so uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to suspend the rules on the timely submission of agenda documents in order that the Commission may consider the late submission of agenda document number 19-14-B. I have a motion from the Vice Chairman to suspend the rules on the timely submission of agenda documents to consider 19-14-B. Um, any discussion on the motion? If not, I'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. And that brings us to the very interesting uh, draft advisory opinion, 2018-12. Mr. Wensicker. Thank you, Chair Weintraub. Good morning, Commissioners. Agenda documents 1843A and 1843B are draft responses to an advisory opinion request submitted by Defending Digital Campaigns, Inc. The requester asks whether it may provide or facilitate the provision of certain cybersecurity services, software, and hardware to federal candidate committees and national party committees on a nonpartisan basis and according to predetermined objective criteria. Draft A concludes that the proposal is permissible because the provision of the services described in the request would not be made for the purpose of influencing a federal election or in connection with the federal election, and thus would not constitute a prohibited in-kind contribution. Draft B concludes that the proposal is, permissible, is impermissible because the provision of the services described in the request would be in connection with a federal election and thus would constitute a prohibited in-kind contribution. We received no comments on the request, Campaign Legal Center submitted a comment on the draft A last October and an updated comment on draft A last week. The requester submitted a comment and supplementary informa information on the drafts. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Wensinger. Uh, and in uh, one of the, uh, in the second comment from CLC, there was a proposal for an alternative analysis. So there's uh, draft A, draft B, and um, not quite draft C, but something that potentially could become draft C. Uh, I'd like to start by asking the requesters if they'd like to um, speak to the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Good morning. Uh, pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, Michael Toner and Mark Elias on behalf of Defending Digital Campaigns, Inc. Love your new space. 
uh, in this meeting room. It's just, it's just lovely. And we really want to thank uh, the commission's patience and indulgence concerning this matter. It's, uh, it's been like Groundhog Day. Every two weeks we were on the agenda and then carried over, but we really appreciate um, uh, uh, the commission uh, accommodating uh, th this matter for many months, uh, uh, because obviously it's a, there, there's a number of novel issues here, complex issues. But uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Rhodes and Robbie Mook. Uh, Matt Rhodes, as you know, former campaign manager for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign. Robbie Mook served as campaign manager for Hillary Rodham Clinton's uh, campaign. Uh, and, and Matt and Robbie just wanted to share uh, uh, some background and thoughts about the nature of this project and, and why uh, they're so invested in it uh, and that we hope will be helpful for the commissioners uh, this morning. So Matt, do you want to kick it off? First off, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks a lot for letting us present today. Uh, I just wanted to start off and thank the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School, because that's where Robbie and I and Mark Elias and Michael Toner and some others came together and set up a group called Defending Digital Democracy. And that group is not affiliated with the C4 we're here to talk about today formally, but our time spent there and all the work that we did together there inspired the idea to try to set up a C4 focused on what we want to focus on in the cybersecurity space. I also want to thank Ash Carter, who's the, the, the chair of the, the Belfer Center, uh, for giving us an opportunity, and Eric Rosenbach, and Debbie Plunkett, who is a part of our C4 but could not be here today. Um, wanted to thank all of them for the inspiration and in bringing us together. Uh, before I turn it over to Robbie, you know, one of the real big reasons why I think that this effort is so important, and, and Michael highlighted the fact that, you know, Robbie and I have worked on presidential campaigns. What we're here today and what we're trying to do isn't really to benefit presidential campaigns, which as you can read in the newspaper, raise lots of hard dollars and have many, many, many opportunities to finance cybersecurity efforts if they choose to. But it's for the, for the down ballot candidates people that don't have as much hard dollars to spend. And when you're setting up a campaign organization, especially at the state level or even the federal level in a House race or a Senate race, when you're first setting up and you're first raising those precious hard dollars, the last thing you want to do is spend them on something to secure your networks or your candidate's email. Um, and so why we came together, one of the big reasons for me is it's not that presidential campaign the little guy campaign uh, that's setting up and, and sometimes these foreign international threats or even our own domestic threats can see these rising campaigns, these rising stars, and really have an opportunity to disrupt our democracy at a level. You can see many of the rising stars coming well in advance. You know, people like former President Barack Obama uh, former President George W. Bush, you could see these rising candidates coming a mile away, and they're very vulnerable at that stage. And that's a big reason why I became a part of this. Uh, and obviously my own experience, which is in here running the Romney campaign and the Chinese threat and hack that we had back in 2012. So that's how I was inspired to come into this. I'll let Robbie speak a little bit and talk about some of the other reasons why we think that this is so important. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I want to <clears throat> I want to echo uh, our appreciation for you having us here today and considering this, and especially for being patient with us as as we work this out. And I I think it is really good that we are here now today doing this, given all the work that's gone in, because I, I I I think there's been. Um, uh, our, our own rationale and thinking behind this has matured as we've gone through this process. So, so thank you for that. Um, just to follow up on what Matt was saying, uh, you know, Matt and I came together because we both worked on presidential campaigns that had been uh, br that had been affected by breaches, um, and 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 that's you know how we got connected uh, with the Belfer Center and. Uh, the, the, the project of the Belfer Center has actually done a lot of work with election officials, but when it came to campaigns, our hands were really tied because it's a nonprofit institution. It cannot be in-kinding assistance to campaigns. So 
I would like to believe we did everything that we could there. We produced a very detailed playbook for campaigns that explains you know, every step they can take. We, we created a training video, um, and all of that is posted online, and therefore I'm not a campaign finance lawyer, but it doesn't have value. That, that was something that we could do to help. But what became immediately clear to us uh, once those resources were put up was it wasn't enough. <laughs> And to, to Matt's point, for the little guy campaigns out there, uh, they, they still were not in a position to properly secure themselves. They just don't have the resources. And there are a few things in particular I wanted to point out where we think that, that this entity can make a demonstrable difference. The first is monitoring networks to see if bad people are in there. That's a really expensive thing, but if you ladder that up um, it can be done at scale at a much lower cost um, and, and, and in-kinded to the campaigns. Um, so that's, that's one just, you know, if, if, we're, if we're thinking about the issue of first, we're not interested in, nobody's interested in making money off this. We're all volunteers here today. And secondly, we're not looking for any loopholes. But there's just a fact that network monitoring is incredibly expensive, and if it's done... Uh, campaign to campaign, it, it's, it's not financially feasible. Um, the second is incident response. So if something has gone wrong, and particularly if you have a nation state actor like North Korea in your network, you need very sophisticated people to go in and help you and figure out what's going on. Again, that is just not something that a small campaign is, uh, is in a position to deal with. And the other very practical thing uh, that we ran into is you have campaigns using email systems, and uh, there are security settings that can be pre-toggled for them, but they're very hard to do on your own. And this is this is part of the problem. We created this playbook, and we're we're putting an enormous burden on campaigns that maybe have one or two staff. They're incredibly busy. The work's just not getting done, and so the threat uh, the threat remains. Um, so I, I, I want to add to the list of uh, to our list of gratitude uh, here with Matt is to the Campaign Legal Center for submitting their remarks because I think what they've done there that's really important is steep this in the context of of preventing foreign meddling and that really is our objective here. Not interested in you know some loophole for campaigns. We just want to make sure that that these foreign nation state actors who are incredibly sophisticated. Don't have don't have an open door to push on uh, to get in to the campaigns, um, and and in particular that we're securing the including the set of things I just mentioned that are that are that are fairly easy to do. They just take resources that the campaigns uh, don't have. And the last thing I want to say is that in case anybody's uh, uh, curious about this, you know. This is truly, based on Matt and I being here, a multinational issue. You know, the, the, the Chinese breached the 2008 presidential campaigns, the 2012 presidential campaigns. Obviously, we've seen uh, Russia involved uh, in 2016, not, by the way, just uh, with uh, people affiliated with the presidential campaign, but at the House campaign level uh, as well. We've seen reports uh, at the uh, on the Republican Party at the House level as well. Um, and th this is multi-candidate. We've seen attempts to breach members of Congress. Uh, and, and I would just lastly say, there's probably a lot we just don't know. You know, we, um, and, and that's why, to me, getting things like network monitoring and instant response out there is so critical right now, uh, because there may be things happening that we don't know about and are never going to get uh, into the news. So um, with that, again, we, we just really appreciate uh, you uh, hearing us out on this today. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'll turn to my colleagues. Are there any questions or discussion? No questions or discussion? Whoa. Well, I have questions. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, Commissioner Wall. First, first of all, I think that's a great idea, what you have in mind. It's really quite commendable. I uh, hope we can get this thing uh, along the road in a way that you can get, get this done. <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, I see that there are some limits uh, for uh, being eligible. And it seemed to me that some of the people at the lower end might be cut out somehow because of the way they have, a, I think, a certain 
vote amount or, or amount of money generated. But there are times when somebody is really struggling out there, and I'm thinking of my own home state, Nevada, uh, not Vegas, but other places where people really don't have a way to uh, even communicate uh, on a way that would uh, protect them. So uh, does that, do those limits, are they hard and fast, or what did you have in mind uh, in a case like that? Um, thank Mr. Toner. Um, I'm sorry. I, I'm recognizing you. No Mr. Apologies. Good morning. Good, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so a couple things. Uh, one is we tried to make the criteria as, as objective as possible because obviously under your precedence, that's really an important factor. But a couple things also uh, came to bear. One, we didn't want to limit this to just Democrats and Republicans. We thought this was really important. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of people in American politics, uh, candidates and, and activists who are in neither party. Uh, and so we wanted to have criteria where third party candidates, independent candidates also could, could qualify for these services. So that's one thing that really stood, for us, stood out for us. Secondly, we wanted to create criteria where there were multiple ways to qualify. So we had the fundraising criteria, as you know, for U.S. House candidates who raised $50,000, Senate candidates who raised $100,000. But we also wanted to cover all general election candidates, no matter how much you might raise and spend. You know, we really thought that was important. And then, uh, and then of course, the, the, the national party committees and the, the presidential campaigns who, who poll uh, at 5% or higher. But our goal was to try to make the criteria as self-executing as possible. Uh, and not have really any discretion uh, so that it would be objective, objectively verifiable, but also be inclusive beyond just the two major parties because we, we do view this as a nonpartisan endeavor at the end of the day. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I think this is going to be very helpful, this discussion, and I really appreciate the the work that you're doing on a bipartisan basis uh, to address a very serious threat, one that I know I'm very concerned about, I know the entire commission is, uh, and, um, and a lot of people are. And I, so I commend you for, for the efforts. Um, so what do you think the fair market value would be of the services that you're providing were someone to want to purchase that kind of protection? Anybody who feels like they know, right. Mr. Mook. Um, it's hard. You mean if you purchase on the commercial market, yep. so to speak? Yeah. I mean, and I, I want to be really clear. I'm a I'm a campaign person, not a cybersecurity expert. So let's just you know uh, let, let's put that out there. But in, when we were looking um, at this question, to have you know true network monitoring, so to speak, so putting sensors in. Um, you know, you can be getting into the tens of thousands of dollars for a campaign. Um, and then something like incident response can be very much in the tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Um, again, if you're dealing with a particularly sophisticated threat actor. When it comes to a, a, a two or three person operation, um, I, I can't say exactly for that. I, I, I had some visibility into what the DNC had to pay, and I'm sure Matt had Matt had visibility uh, on the on the Romney campaign. Um, but again, I, I think an important point to make here is if these campaigns have to go it alone, I think the cost is dramatically higher. If that makes sense, and they have um, as I said. I am no cybersecurity expert. I've I've actually learned a lot over the last two years. If I was myself. 10 years ago running a Senate race and I had to go out and find cybersecurity vendors to monitor my network. First of all, I wouldn't even know what that means. And second of all, I would have no criteria through which to evaluate that. And so I think one of the, one of the other benefits of this is hopefully that we are providing a trusted partner uh, with, with which the campaigns can make good judgments um, about all of this. I would just add, first off, <clears throat> let me put it on the record, I am not a cybersecurity expert either. <laughs> okay, let's put it on the record. We have no cybersecurity experts in the room. Okay. That's not what we brought to the table. Um, but when you think about what it would cost an individual campaign, even if it costs $1,500, if you're running from off for office in Elko, Nevada, and you're setting up a campaign, 1500 bucks and hard dollars, that's a lot of money. And what it does is it immediately kind of, if you're the campaign manager or the candidate, you just, it's something, you know, you might want, but you, you can't really have. 
if you're an, an upstart campaign. And, and that's why when we set up this campaign playbook, which I hope is helpful, everything that's in there for the most part is free. But at the end of the day, you get what you pay for. And so that's kind of how we came to the next concept, the next, you know, format of what we thought we could do and in, in, in setting up a C4 to try to help that candidate in Elko or $1,500 to have someone come in and look at a candidate's email systems and networks at home. They're just not going to do it. But it seems to me that you, there's something in between. There's, you know, you're, you're positing that every candidate would be on their own and they would therefore have to be buying at top value uh, uh -huh. and would be, you know, perhaps not well positioned to find good services. I mean, another way of doing what you are trying to do would be to take advantage of scale, as you, as you suggested before, you know, make a package of services available across the board. Um, and because you're doing it for so many people and because you would be a, you know, you would both be a trusted source, but because of the volume, presumably you could offer it at a, at a reasonable but lower cost. I mean, the, the, there's no question that what you want to do is a good thing. The, the, the question for the commission is, is it legal? And the, the, the reason why that's a question is because you want to offer it for free as opposed to having people pay for it. So um, I want to make sure that in, in pursuit of a very good goal that we do not inadvertently blow a hole through the corporate contribution ban. You know, that's, that's where I'm coming from. So, um, you know, I would, I, I would like to support this endeavor. I also have an obligation to protect the law. So one question that I have is, given the scale at which you would be able to do it, couldn't you just offer this at a reasonable price? Uh, and Madam Chair, I, I completely appreciate that position, particularly my career has in part been about getting corporate money out of politics. So I'm entirely, as, as the Democrat here, I'm entirely uh, sympathetic to that. And I, the there last may thing- Maybe another Democrat over there. So. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. My, my sidekick here. <laughs> uh, he would, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Keeps me out of trouble. Um, one day at a time. <laughs> one, one day. <laughs> um, so the last thing I would ever do, I would ever want to do is create a loophole like that, trust me. Um, uh, particularly, you know, in, in this space right now. Um, I guess what I would point to in particular is this, is two things, monitoring these networks and providing incident response. I, if someone is is breached, I mean, it's it's weeks, maybe even months of work to really get in there and figure out what's going on. Um, that's enormously expensive. And I don't, based on our evaluation, I don't see a way to just kind of package that up. There's a secondary issue that we have, which is working with major email providers to create some sort of pre-toggled version of what they're doing. And what we have encountered in the corporate space is that for them to start doing that, are they triggering some sort of in-kind by, by providing a special service to campaigns? So. Again, I really appreciate the point you're making. And I think for us, it's the flexibility we're asking for here is less about just get as much, you know, it's, it's like Walmart on the, you know, on Black Friday where we're just loading everything in the cart and, you know, trying to run away with as much as we can. This is just about giving ourselves the flexibility that, you know, if you need really specialized network or sensors on a network, we can just get that done. We can, or we, we at least have the flexibility to get that done. That's really where I'm coming from. And I guess the other thing I'd offer as a way of thinking about this is, um, you know, this is really at the end of, the, and I'm not a national security expert either. This is warfare in a way. I mean, people are trying to disrupt our democracy and the, and the people, the agents that are doing this are, arms are, 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 are members of the military, basically, in other countries. And so, you know, if, if campaigns needed military weapon systems to defend themselves, I, I, you know, we, we'd say, my gosh, they don't know anything about that. How are they supposed to be able to do that? So it's sort of an extreme example, but I just say it's, we're really looking at a similar level of sophistication and all we're asking for is that flexibility to deliver 
the capabilities they need when they need them. And part of the reason we have the C4 is to, is to wash away that interaction that would create the influence that you and frankly I would be really concerned about. And, 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 and Madam Chair, if I might, just to build on, on Mr. Mook's comments, because this, this corporate contribution issue, obviously the heart of this, and we, we take that very seriously. And so we tried to design what we were proposing here with a number of layers of insulation uh, to maintain the integrity of the, of the corporate contribution ban. One, we talked about earlier, the objective criteria, you know, the neutral objective criteria. Um, secondly, the fact that uh, we really run this organization like a charitable organization. As you saw in our papers, even though this is organized as a C4, uh, we're following the strictures, uh, the IRS strictures for a, for a 501c3 organization. Um, you know, all, you know, these safeguards designed to uh, not have this be for the purpose of influencing an election. Uh, and as, as Robbie was indicating earlier, and Matt may have touched on it, we don't even know the campaigns who are going to be attacked. We don't know where they're going to be running. We don't know which party they're going to be running under, and, and, and it's not our focus. Uh, who's going to most need these services? Um, so we, you know, we tried to build in those those layers of protections, uh, uh, focused around trying to trying to establish that this is not for the purpose of of influencing a federal election, not not designed to try to influence the outcome of, of what happens uh, in the elections. And then the other thing that we've tried to do is make this as inclusive as possible um, beyond just federal campaigns and committees. We think that's really important. Uh, we've begun work over a number of months with um, some non-governmental organizations, civic organizations. Our papers mention a couple that we've already started working with. Uh, we're looking to recruit more because I think our view is this, this has got to be an inclusive process involving government, involving civic organizations, involving campaigns and parties. That, that's absolutely true. Um, but have it be as broad a universe as possible. And, and, you know, the focal point there being, first of all, we think it's the right thing to do, but beyond that, um, that, um, that this is not just about uh, elections. This is about protecting uh, the democratic process at, at, at all levels. So, so it's a long way of saying we, we're tr we've been trying to do everything possible uh, to um, insulate this process uh, from the corporate contribution ban, because Madam Chair, I mean, that is the, the, the central issue here. Um, and that's one reason why over these months, we've needed a little bit extra time on this uh, to, uh, to build out those safeguards, but that was, that was the aim of our endeavor there. So there's obviously a lot of money behind this operation. How is the money raised and um, are there any candidates, office holders, politicians involved in the fundraising, are they insulated from any uh, contact with the funders? Because one potential problem I could see down the road, and I always have to worry about, okay, if we say yes to you, what's going to be the next uh, question that's going to be asked, and what, what other entity out there might feel uh, empowered by this AO to not even ask, perhaps, and just go out and say, well, I think based on that AO, I can do this. Um, so one concern that I have is, could this become uh, an opportunity for people who are trying to curry favor with office holders, perhaps office holders on both sides of the aisle, uh, to um, give valuable prizes to them in order to have opportunities to, uh, as I said, influence perhaps other policies. You guys want to talk about the fundraising? And go, go. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mock. So again, uh, thank you. Uh, and again, um, it's a very good question. Um, as it relates to, to fundraising right now, to be honest with you, Matt and I have been waiting to uh, to get a ruling on this until we really proceed with planning in depth. But I can tell you two things. Number one, we have no plans whatsoever to ask elected officials to engage in fundraising in any way. And secondly, the only donors that we have considered um, for the organization have been individuals and foundations. Um, and lastly, I, actually I will add, um, our plan is to make the organization as lightweight as possible and to, uh, again, get the resources to uh, the candidates and parties as directly as possible. Um, uh, so we hope that the overhead of this organization is not, is not enormous and that fundraising isn't 
an ongoing obligation in the way, for example, when we're on a campaign, that it is just a never ending process and that you have to bring out surrogates and so on to keep that money coming. Our, our hope is to, our hope is to, to design a budget um, and a fundraising strategy that, that keeps fundraising to a minimum, frankly. Can I add? Sure, Mr. Can I add two, um, two um, unrelated points, uh, related to your questions, but two points. Uh, uh, the first um, is I want to be clear because it's something that I think was implicit in something that was said, but I want to make it explicit. Um, neither me nor my firm nor Michael nor his firm are being compensated to represent this organization. So when you say there's a lot of org money in the organization and they say that, that, that they are lightweight, um, I, I cannot think of another instance where I have ever sat before the commission or submitted something before the commission um, as a pro bono matter because as I explained to lots of very worthy organizations that come to me, I do pro bono in other areas, but one of the things I tell them when they ask me if I can represent them before the commission is that that's, that's the business that I'm in. And if I offer you free legal services, how am I gonna tell the next good organization and worthy organization that you know, I have to charge them? And the exception- that I remember I, that problem. Yeah, and the <laughs> exception that I have made in 25 years is for this organization. And it's because Frankly, they are, they are looking to solve a, something that goes not to the threat of money in politics or the threat of, of loopholes in the system. They're, they're going to something that, frankly, has the capability of undermining the ability to hold democratic elections at all. And in that sense, it is the most profoundly important work I think I've ever done uh, before the commission, um, uh, because if if ultimately, as Matt said, if ultimately nation states are able to pick and choose among the rising stars in the in the in the political system, and essentially strangle them uh, in the crib, then there will be no, then 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 we simply won't have a functioning democracy. So I wanted to be clear that that the the statements that were made about about um, about this organization and its finances and the involvement, you know, extend to lawyers. And I hope, uh, Michael, you didn't mind me <clears throat> revealing that with respect to your firm. The second point I wanted to make is is a more broader policy or a more broader policy point, which is, at various times, um, the commission has faced um, the application of a law that was passed in nineteen in the nineteen seventies to the realities of modern campaigns and technology and elections and threats and opportunities and the like. And one of the things that I think um, that, you o that you are always struggling with in that area is how do you remain, um, how do you keep fealty to the statute while at the other time, uh, while at the same time allowing the statute to breathe and have that flexibility. And I've at various times urged the commission um, in other contexts to, to find that room to breathe. You know, I'm always, I'm not a telecom lawyer. I know nothing about telecom. I know less about telecom than I do about cybersecurity. I know almost nothing about cybersecurity. But I'm always struck that there is this law that was written seemingly like in the 1930s or 40s or 50s, whenever it was, that is like applied to the internet. And like they have all these rulemakings about like things that they just couldn't have imagined existed and yet they find ways to build flexibility or regulatory um, meaning around that. Um, and I think that where this commission has been at its best, it does the same thing. And where it has, where it has come up short at times is where it's, where it's been unable to find a way to sort of bring these, these sort of concepts from, you know, the age of Buckley into the, into the, into the current age. And, you know, I think that um, it's notable that Campaign Legal Center, which is oftentimes, you know, I would say on the side of, of worrying about how that modernization would cut against loopholes, I think it's actually notable that they, uh, what their second set of comments are. Because I think, I think that the, um, 
you know, the last time I remember having this exact sort of discussion, it's been a while since I've been before the commission, um, but was, um, you know, both Congress in McCain-Feingold and Congress then in a supplemental law and then this commission in a series of advisory opinions um, dealt with the question of convention funding, recount and litigation funding and headquarters funding. And I think I sat here and said, if the commission can't find a way to make this work, the system just breaks. And when it breaks, like any number of things can happen. And I'm not sure that from the reform community standpoint, the, the resolution of that, that breaking point ended up in a more satisfactory position than they would have been then from their standpoint uh, if if the system had just breathed a little more um, uh, because obviously the net result was Congress stepped in and passed the law which which explicitly solved the problem but solved the problem and then some and that I think <laughs> didn't you have something to do with that Mr. Lyons? I, I did I did and that's that's I mean the point is that that there, the commission has an opportunity to do something, and I think CLC and others understand this. They have an opportunity to do something to let this statute breathe in a way that keeps, whether it's China or North Korea or Russia, from fundamentally undermining democracy. And I fear that if the commission can't find that space, what's going to come is either going to be something that's awful for democracy or something that may be less advantageous to people who are worried about those loopholes, like, like Robbie, like myself, like um, I know all the four of, four of you do. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think that this is like a really good opportunity for this commission to show in a bipartisan time where you have literally, you know, a, these are not, you know, these are not your squishy Republicans. Like we know how I know how to find those, right? I know how to right. We know how to like. If I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say. But if I listed my favorite Republicans, it would be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be. You know. Anyway. Oh come That's a on. That's a compliment, you. right? They're no. such and nice have, guys. What I'm are you sure talking that, about? And I'm sure that if you ask them who their most favorite Democrats are, you wouldn't have Hillary Clinton's campaign manager <laughs> and and general counsel. So, you know, this is an opportunity for this commission to sort of seize this seize this moment and really do something that advances um, democracy. And I hope, I hope you do so. I, I hear everything you're saying, but if it is, uh, one question that I have is if it is so important to democracy and if it is a national security issue, and, and I think it is on both counts, why isn't the government paying for this? Well, so let me address that again. I think that the, there's a policy. Or, or let me actually rephrase that a second. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but obviously it's not, you're not in charge of the government. I'm not in I charge was of the make government. A, well, you're more in charge of the government than right. I am. Well, I'm in charge of a little piece of the government, well, but not the one I'm that would fund sure. this uh, operation. But I guess the question is really, would it be better if it were funded by the government rather than by private sources? Look, I think there are consequences to all different kinds of public policy choices about how things are funded and not. We have a private funding system around elections. Uh, we went from having public funding of, uh, of conventions, which I thought was relatively non-controversial, uh, to now having private funding of conventions. So. That's a that's a policy judgment that, frankly, is you know above certainly above my pay grade, um, uh, or ability to you know to to wish one way or the other. I think though that in some ways the reason why I drew the parallel to the last you know to the to the other um, uh, the the last cromnibus change is that. In some ways, you could say, well, that was a success. That was Congress exercising its legislative power. The other way to look at it is to say that there are these opportunities for the commission, like the FCC or the SEC or the others, to like say, you know, we're going to take this old statute and we're just, we're a policy-making body in, in, in our own right. And we are going to take these statutes and we're going to put vitality in them to meet the challenges of today in the same way that the that the SEC does, or that you are around, apparently around cryptocurrency, uh, uh, 
um, which is something that couldn't have been contemplated by, by the statute in the 1970s. And I, I, I think that this is like a really important moment for the commission to signal that when, you know, two partisans come to you and say, we want to help Green Party candidates and Libertarian candidates on the same basis as we help Democrats and Republicans. We want to help small candidates in um, Pahrumpf uh, uh, the same way that we want to do help them in Chicago. Like, I think that that's like an important moment for the commission. And that was, you know, and, and that, that it could also be an important moment for other branches of government, I don't think changes that. So um, I'll, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'll uh, turn it over to you, Commissioner Walther. Um, so that kind of goes to it not being, you know, to bring it back to the law again, because um, it's a it's a nice idea to do breathe vitality into the law, but ultimately the law has to provide that breathing space. You know, there's just so far I can go given the words in the statute book. And what you said, it seems to me, goes to an argument that uh, these services would not be for the purpose of influencing an election. But the more difficult question is, how is this not in connection with an election, which we also kind of have to get by? I'll, sure. Either of the lawyers, Mr. Tony. Absolutely. Well, I'll take a first stab at it, Mr. Elias. I have more, say, more remarks to offer. But um, a, a couple things. Um, first, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Those are two issues that are always on the table, and we've done everything. Um, we've made, we've tried uh, as hard as we could to um, create the record that this is not for the purpose of influencing a federal election. That this is a nonpartisan endeavor. You know, in terms of how our organization structured, the objective criteria. Um, and how inclusive the process is. So that um, we really were aiming at the f for the purpose of influencing standard. In terms of the in connection with standard, a couple things I would offer. As you know, occasionally in the past, a number of times in the past, um, the commission's really wrapped up that analysis within the for, for the purpose of influencing a federal election analysis. Uh, for example, in the third millennium AO some years ago, uh, as I recall, there wasn't an independent consideration or evaluation of the in connection with uh, issue. It was really wrapped up in the larger for the purpose of influencing a federal election standard. So that's the first thing I would offer. And second of all, um, like we outlined in our in our comments, um, is that this is a broader endeavor than just working with federal campaigns and committees. We think that's really important. Uh, this involves civic organizations. It involves non-governmental organizations. It involves uh, governmental organizations. Um, and so um, to the extent that the commission um, focuses on the in connection with uh, analysis, the fact that this is a really broad universe of, of organizations and entities that, that uh, DDC is working with, we think that's important. We think that's, we think that's significant. Um, and, uh, and also we think it's important for the organization to be effective. It's part of the programmatic mission of the organization. Um, but Madam Chair, to go to your point, I mean, we, 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 we're very sensitive to these two issues. We've, we've really done a lot of work over the last few months to try to uh, safeguard our operations with those two uh, legal issues in mind. Um, and so um, uh, that, that's how we approach them. And Mr. Elias, you might have some additional All thoughts. All right, before I, I turn uh, to you, Mr. Yeah. Elias, I just want to ask for a point of clarification, uh, Mr. Tony, did you say you're also going to be offering these services to governmental organizations? Well, we interact and work with them. We, uh, we, we've had discussions with them and we are working with them along with the civic organizations and the non-governmental organizations. I guess uh, in our comments, we mentioned the Truman uh, the Truman Center for National Policy and the Hudson Institute, uh, Hudson Institute as some non-governmental organizations we've been working with. Yeah, I was just wondering, based on your, your comment, whether um, you meant to offer the same package of services to, and I don't, I don't I'm just yeah. curious, um, to actual governmental organizations, I don't know, state, local governments? You guys want to talk about sort of the government, the interaction with governmental organizations? And well, I, Madam Chair, I was going to make one point because I thought you raised a pretty important point. Um, why not the government? And uh, I'm kind of a realist, and I think we'd probably have a different viewpoint. But to get beyond why not the government, the reality you know, is... I like to think of myself as a realist. Uh, we might disagree on some other things. Well, right now, the reality is the government isn't stepping in and helping campaigns. And the other reality that Robbie and I have seen on both sides of the aisle. I think you'd find a lot of skepticism amongst people that run campaigns right now, both on the left 
and the right of whether or not they would want the government to step in and try to help make their networks more secure uh, the way Robbie's talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's provided a need and an opportunity for us to come together. So I just wanted to go back to that point, and I don't know if Robbie did. Yeah, I just quickly add on that. It, it, I'll sort of answer uh, both questions, I think. Um, the first thing to underscore what Matt said is, I think today, given a lot of different factors, it's not happening, A, and B, the campaigns, there would be barriers to entry potentially from the campaigns and it is what it is if we're if we're in a in a in a realist scenario here i believe however that this organization because it is bipartisan because it is trusted by the campaigns ideally because it, it will be you know board members will be real partisans who are able to communicate with their respective communities that we can actually begin to change that culturally and we can we can be a catalyst to create a better more productive symbiotic relationship between the government agencies that in theory are supposed to be providing protection um, and the campaigns. And look, Matt and I, to be frank, have a different point of view on the role the government should play. I have written about this publicly, so you can go read that. Um, it is possible that as a result of this organization and as a result of that better relationship, it may be that the organization is no longer needed at some point. I would almost argue, I think Matt and I would agree on this, maybe for different reasons. I think it would be nice someday if this didn't have to exist at all. It's just not a problem. You know, there's, um, uh, and you know, physical security didn't used to be something the government provided and, and it does today. So um, I, I think we, we have different viewpoints on where we'll get I believe no matter where you think we need to go, I think this organization can can help to speed that up. As it relates to government entities and election officials in particular, we've done a lot of work through the Belfer Center with election officials. It's been really productive. They've made clear that they want uh, they want to create uh, separation between them and campaigns, which I think is entirely understandable. So. Um, uh, we've explicitly did not put a, the election infrastructure in here. It is just for campaigns. Mark, Mark, do you want? Yeah, please. Yeah, if I can address the in connection with. Yep, please. So I think that the you know, um, uh, you could probably write a treatise on in connection with an election. Um, if you look obviously at what the Federal Election Campaign Act was intended by Congress to be. Um, you wind up with a in connection with an election test that looks dramatically different than what, as a result of various Supreme Court decisions and other and other um, uh, and other interpretations, the act looks like uh, looks like today. I mean, in some sense, relying on in connection with an election proves too much because, um, uh, you know, the state of of Virginia setting up polling locations is an expenditure in connection with an election. But yet the FEC doesn't tell the state of Virginia it can't do it. Um, so it's, and, and if an incorporated city in New York, which most cities in New York are incorporated, most villages in New York are incorporated, puts out, um, uh, 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 you know, commandeer schools <laughs> to hold elections in them, you don't say, well, that's a corporate expenditure because it's in connection with an election. Even though, as you know, states, unlike the federal government, states are not exempt from the contribution limits. You could have an incorporated town. So I think going down the, the rabbit hole of in connection with, with divorced from for the purpose of influencing, opens up, it, it just proves too much. I mean, the in connection with by itself would, would, would roll back um, huge chunks of the commission's existing regulations, all of, you know, 109.21 or point twenty whatever the, not 21, one of them's parties and one of them's non-parties, but, you know, the, the whole purpose of cabining certain speech outside of, you know, 90 days or outside of 120 days of an election was a recognition that there's stuff that's going to be in connection with an election in some sense. I mean, it has, you know, but it's not for the purpose of influencing an election. Um, so I, 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 I worry about that as a, uh, doctrinally, I think that that, that creates um, a little bit of, of problem. But beyond that, 
the purpose of, you know, and I say this as a good and loyal Democrat who grew up and uh, grew up with Chevron deference and, you know, believe in it. Um, uh, 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 the role of a federal agency is to give, is to put meat on those bones. And the, to, from my vantage point, the in connection with language and for the purpose of influencing language, the Supreme Court has set a ceiling as to what that can mean. In other words, it can't mean more than a certain thing. But this agency's got wide latitude underneath that ceiling, under, underneath that constitutional ceiling to determine whether something is in connection with an election or not, or recounts in connection with an election. As you recall, prior to the change in the law, the commission took a position with respect to funding recounts is redistricting in connection with an election. The commission has taken various, you know, is ballot access getting, getting on the ballot in connection with an election? Is defending a lawsuit against Fox News against a former Senate candidate in connection with an election? In other words, the commission has a lot of territory, uh, that, a lot of ground that it can cover um, to decide that something is not for the purpose of influencing an election or not in connection with an election. You know, if, if a prospective Republican candidate travels to Washington, D.C. For, for, to meet with a mayoral group and also to meet with the NRCC, is that in connection with an election? The commission could say no. It's not in connection with an election because the primary purpose of the trip was this, was this other thing and we're going to give primacy to that. So I think I think the in connection with language, rather than to causing trouble, troubling me, it's actually, the, it is what I keep describing as allowing this commission to give vitality and, and breathe life into this statute. Because that's the kind of language that lets you look at something like this and say, you know what, we are here because we're experts and we're just simply going to say that in this time, in this need, this is not for the purpose of influencing or in connection with an election. And so to me, rather than being troubling, I think that's actually in, that's the enabling language no, that no, allows you to do, true. to grant what they've asked for. But is that because that's what the words mean or, or because we can just say that's what the words mean? Because I think that, I think that the Supreme Court has told you what those words can't mean. It can't mean more than something. Underneath that, is where you get to, as, a, as, a, as an administrative agency, you get to apply um, the experiences and the judgments that the commission has gathered. And, the, and I, have, I have, you know, uh, Madam Chair, you have been quite eloquent on the issues of foreign money and foreign involvement in elections. So this is something that I know is in your, is in your um, area of interest and expertise as it is the entire commission. And you have sitting before you two campaign operatives, I hope that's not an insult, who have played at the, who have, who have, who have done that at the highest levels, at the mid levels, and at the smallest, le the most grassroots levels, I won't say smallest, most grassroots levels. And they're here telling you um, how to, how the experiences of real life should judge whether something is for the purpose of influencing or is in, or is in connection with. And they're telling you it's not. They're telling you it is, it is not for the purpose of influencing an election. It is for the purpose of preventing foreign interference in strangling democracy. They are telling you it is not in connection with an election. They are telling you it's in connection with protection in the same way physical security would be, in the same way that 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 um, that that something else would be, and and that's within your authority uh, to to do it. And like I said, the fact that the campaign legal center, campaign legal center does not typically uh, endorse views that I have uh, that I have espoused. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think uh, that's on, fair. Nor nor me. Well, well, well yes. And, and, <laughs> As Trevor reminds me regularly, so this is a rare moment for the commission to. You know, to to bask in that in that in that in the consensus that you're hearing. <laughs> it's rare. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, Commissioner Walther, did you have another question? It's hard to beat that. <laughs> I, um, I, I think uh, we all recognize that th that this is a very important thing, and and uh, trying to uh, see how we can uh, work with you and, and figure out something, but. Um, 
And I did want to ask you, and that was going to ask you before you spoke so highly of uh, this campaign legal center, uh, you've seen your comments. Uh, how do you feel about them, uh, the, the points that they raise? Uh, th thank you, Commissioner Walter. Uh, first of all, uh, as Mr. Elias indicated, um, we, we welcome their comments and we welcome their support um, because they uh, are very active before this agency and um, they, they often don't um, concur with the things that <laughs> Mr. Elias and I want to do. Uh, so we are basking in that momentary uh, 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 detente. Uh, we'll see how long it lasts. Um, but uh, a couple things. I mean, as we see it, there, there, there are independent grounds for the agency to, to approve the advisory opinion. I mean, uh, we've been laying out one ground, which would be concluding that this is not for the purpose of influencing a federal election, not in connection with an election. And, and obviously, we've approach the advisory opinion under that framework. But then, uh, you know, the Campaign Legal Center really is advancing an independent ground for approval, really focusing on law enforcement uh, and protecting the integrity of the foreign national ban uh, in, 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 in American elections. And we respect that. Um, uh, we, re we respect the, the viewpoint that the Campaign Legal Center is articulating. Um, so we see it as an independent ground. Uh, it's it's uh, it's novel. I, I mean, I will confess it's a novel ground, but we well, we respect it. Um, um, so I, I think that's how we see it. That there's independent ways for the, for the agency to approve to approve this this matter if 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 you decide that that's how you want to come out. We've done that a little bit uh, with respect to that sergeant at arms uh, one, where we provided uh, a, a method to provide security. A uh, little out of the normal bailiwick. This is one like that yes. in some regards. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's right, Commissioner. Well, I have to point out in the Sergeant at Arms case, we said they could use campaign funds. We didn't say you're you're being physically threatened, and therefore you can accept free services from security companies. So it's it's uh, not necessarily a uh, uh, good precedent for what you're asking for today. Did you want to? Commissioner Hunter. Do you have any more questions? So go ahead. Both. Not at the moment. Go ahead. Okay. This has been a, an interesting exchange. Thank you to all of you for coming. You. I, I just have, you know, thought, listened to everything you've said. I agree with everything all of the commenters have, have stated today. And I just see absolutely no evidence that anything you're doing is for the purpose of influencing an election, or in can, I just don't even see that argument. And uh, so for me, it's a it's a it's an easy call. I, I respect where my colleagues are coming from. You know, I we're willing to work with them. But um, as Mr. Elias states, there's been many times where we've said something that, in my mind, is closer to an election than this. And we've said it was fine. I think the recount AO is, is the example you're talking about. And there's a, a lot of other ones. This is so far attenuated from that in my mind, uh, particularly because it's a bipartisan effort. You have objective criteria for campaigns to get involved. It just, for me, is a very easy question um, and a rare opportunity to, to do something to um, stop, the, stop for, foreign influence in elections, which obviously all of us favor. Um, I think um, that the notion that a government would get involved in this sort of work, um, I agree with what Mr. Rhodes said. There, I don't know of a single campaign, especially on the Republican side, that would turn their computers over to the government. And I know even state, state election officials who are dealing with uh, voting machines are, are adamantly opposed to doing so, and many of them will, will fight to the end to, to avoid that. So the notion of that working um, is, is really far-fetched and, and um, doesn't really support the, the federalism you know, that, we've all, that we all live with. So I think this is a, a, a terrific idea. Um, I'm in support of draft A. Uh, to the extent that um, the CLC comment is something that the requesters have supported, I'm willing to support that with some edits, with some relatively minor edits that we've shared with our colleagues uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, we're, so we're, we're willing to support that with some, with some edits at the appropriate time. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and appreciate all of your uh, presence here for the comments that you've delivered, uh, both in written and also here. I think that you've um, um, made a very strong case for why uh, an advisory opinion should be issued on this particular question. 
Uh, for many of the reasons that Commissioner Hunter uh, just mentioned, I also support draft day. The fact that this is being offered on a nonpartisan basis, that there are objective criteria to establish who can participate, but the fact that it has a broader uh, mission than just candidates and parties and is also extending uh, to civic organizations, non-governmental uh, non organizations. Um, for that reason, I, I believe that the analysis about this not being uh, for the purpose of influencing an election or in connection with an election is correct and therefore would not be a contribution. Um, and so I, I would support that. Um, if my if we don't have four votes for that, and we uh, there's um, a desire to look at the independent basis regarding the uh, uh, preventing um, violations of the foreign national prohibition at uh, section 3121. I'm certainly open to working with my colleagues on that. We've had some uh, further discussions, um, and and from the. Hopefully, I'm not overstating it, but from those discussions, I've, I've, I have some optimism that we, we could arrive at a yes, um, but uh, I just want to state what my position is and indicate my willingness to work with my colleagues, uh, and it would be great if we could even wrap that up today when we have uh, requesters here with us uh, so that they could get an answer to their question. Let me ask one other question. You're organized as a C4, not a C3? Correct, Madam Chair, C4. That's correct. So do I have to worry about this turning into a lobbying organization, um, you know, based on – I'm just kind of perplexed as to why it's not a C3. Well, so, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll – um, two things. Uh, as you know, in our um, – Organizational documents, uh, we have um, uh, required the organization to operate consistent with being a 501c3 uh, entity in terms of no uh, intervention in federal elections within the meaning of the C3 uh, prohibition. Uh, I'm not aware of any lobbying efforts the organization's planning, but um, Matt and Robbie, any comments you want to offer on that? Or I'm not aware of, of any such plans or activities. No plans. Any, any comment on why you chose a C4 rather than a C3? Did we talk, did we think about it? I don't know, did we ever think about it? Anymore? My recollection was we couldn't do a C3. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I'll, 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 yeah, just, please. I think that there, um, there are obviously greater, um, restrictions on 501c3s um, with respect to, because of the tax deductible um, contributions. Um, we plan, the organization is going to operate as a c3, uh, operate programmatically as a c3. The question of whether or not um, the IRS would believe that the organization met the, te the, the definition of 501c3 was a complex enough question. They may very well have. They may not have. You are in a greater state of limbo um, in that circumstance um, than doing what we did here, which is essentially seek to just where we simply are a C4 that is operating as a C3. With that, yeah. I hear you. I'm looking to see. Well, uh, this is what I uh, am going to suggest. Um, I'm not comfortable with draft A. Um, I think that uh, each of us have looked at the comment that was submitted by uh, CLC and thought, that could be a basis for moving forward, but we each had our own thoughts as to language that we'd like to see tweaked in there. Obviously, we would have to have a final document on blue paper for us to vote on, uh, and we don't have that at this moment. Uh, and we have uh, a couple of other requesters who have been patiently waiting to have their um, AOs discussed. So. What I'm going to suggest to my colleagues is that we move on to the other AOs and then take a recess and perhaps come back at, I'm guessing, two, something like that, to give us time to uh, go back through um, 
that uh, third alternative and see if there's some place that four commissioners could land. Uh, does that work for folks, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's a, um, I think that that is a constructive suggestion. Uh, I'm, I think that the other requesters, uh, I think, would appreciate that uh, we, we dispose of, of their matters while we uh, go through those negotiations. But I, I appreciate that um, we might be able to get this done today while we have requesters here. Um, and that this matter, which is, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, had to have been extended a number of uh, a number of months, that we might be able to not have that extend even another few weeks. Uh, so I, I I think that that's a very good suggestion. Look forward to working with you further on, on seeing if we can't uh, craft a consensus. And and hopefully would be able to provide it to the requesters with you know at least a little bit of time to read through it and. See if they wanted to provide us with any comment on any ultimate draft where we thought we might land. Um, Commissioner Hunter. I just don't know if the requesters are going to be able to come back at 2 o'clock. I mean, they have other jobs, clients, and that sort of thing. I, and so in the event, I'm just asking you, would you rather come back at 2 o'clock, do this the next open meeting, or are there issues that we want to discuss regarding the what, what we can call the compromise draft that we want to ask them now while they're here so they don't have to come back at 2 o'clock? I mean, I think, um, as I said earlier, the edits that we made to the CLC draft were relatively minor. I I'm happy to talk about that. If you have any questions with, for them now, do you, do you guys want to come back or, or come back a different day? Can we caucus for... Can we, could, could we yes, can absolutely. We, just two absolutely. minutes, could we just? Yes, feel thank, free. Thank you. Uh, I, and I'll you. just, while you're doing that, I'll just say in response to my colleague's question, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not inclined to try and write the document at the table. I, I've never found that to be the best way to get a, a well-crafted document done. But we'll recess for a couple of minutes here. Okay, back from our little recess. Um, Requesters have uh, informed me that uh, rather than wait around and see what happens at 2 o'clock, they'd prefer to just hold it over uh, for the next meeting in two weeks, uh, even though that will be take your kids to work day. And well, the kids will be very uh, entertained by that, I'm sure. Um, so I just have uh, uh, a couple more questions uh, for you. Um, You've made a, a very compelling case, and um, uh, requesters are, are plainly, you know, sincere and thoughtful, and you have very eloquent attorneys um, who are very persuasive. Let me just ask a couple more questions. Uh, one is, um, I, I hear what you're saying about how small can't, uh, you know, first-time candidates, up-and-comers, you know, don't have a lot of resources. But the parties have a lot of resources. Um, so why not have the National Party Committees provide this service for all of their candidates? I, I think, um, you know, a challenge, I'm going to speak for the Democratic side, obviously. I can't speak for the, the Republican side. I think a challenge that um, parties tend to face, or at least we have tended to face, is the leadership. First of all, the, the party is fragmented into multiple committees, A. B, the leadership of those committees changes every few years. Um, and C, you'll be shocked to hear there's gambling in the casino, there's politics. And so. Yeah. I am shocked. Uh, yeah. So the, in, in the same way that I would love to say, we'll just go to the FBI and to Department of Homeland Security and just have a conversation, explain all these vulnerabilities, and they'll come and they'll walk into the campaigns and fix everything. I would love to be able to say that the Democratic National Committee or the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee could sit in a room, work out a budget, deploy this out, and there's no problems. Uh, that's not, uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussion today about what's realistic. Frankly, given the, the threat and the urgency, it's just not realistic. And I wish that was the case. And I, you know, Matt, Matt and I, again, I'll speak for the Democratic side, you know, we've been doing everything we can and we got to this point because it just wasn't enough. And, and the breaking point for me was when a House campaign was breached this year in California on the Democratic side, it just, and it, and it was utterly preventable. And so, um, again, I am, I would be the first one here today to say, if this thing doesn't need to exist in five years, that's terrific. We've done our job. We've gotten to a better place. But uh, for the next few years, for, on the Democratic side, we need this. 
I would just add the, the campaign committees on the Republican and Democrat side were very helpful in our efforts at the Belfer Center, especially in distributing the campaign playbook that we did. But back to being a realist, I just don't know that these campaign committees, A, would have the resources to do it. Well, the National Party Committee seemed to have, you know, pretty I, healthy budgets. We could debate that, but I still don't believe that they would have the resources to do this. And just like, and I think Robbie was kind of making this point, just like the point I made about the federal government being involved in looking at network drives, there would be Republicans running for office across this country that I don't think would be in tune with Republican Party officials at the national level going through their computers, and I think that would be the same on the Democrat side as well. And But do you think they would be comfortable with your folks doing it? I think that, yes, they would be more comfortable. Would everyone be comfortable? Of course not. Of course not. But I think more would. Isn't the Kennedy School sort of, you know, associated with that nefarious liberal elite Eastern institution? I want to thank the Belfer Center again. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about the Harvard Kennedy School. They've been incredible. I would helpful. also just point out, this is a factual matter. Okay. Um, obviously, their the request um, covers independents and third party candidates as well. No, right, right. Okay. Of course. That, uh, mm -hmm. So. I am not often associated with minor parties. Um, it is important just as a factual matter yeah, that, there yeah. is, that, that solving this for the two major yeah. national parties wouldn't necessarily solve it for yeah. independence or minor party candidates. Can, can I make another quick thought on this? Is that the other thing that we encountered is if parties themselves try to go to providers and begin talks, particularly on customized support, there's immediately an issue around favoring one party over another. And so I actually think this provides a way to create the custom tools and support that campaigns need that doesn't actually on the other end create the appearance of favoritism by an entity. So that would be just another thing I'd, I'd put out there. I, I think we'll actually move faster at getting what we need uh, through this vehicle. And then look, and I would say this without favor to either party, I think this also means everyone in any party will have the same access to the same things right away. And therefore, I actually think we are creating a more even playing field. You know. Level playing field, are we allowed to do that? <laughs> Sounds good to me, but. Uh, Commissioner Walter, did you have a? I just want to say, um, I don't know if uh, what, uh, you're gonna be able to be available next you know, Thursday after next Thursday, but uh, I really feel this is a great program. And it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work if it was, you know, the parties that just, uh, like for the various reasons you mentioned, uh, you wouldn't get the same receptivity from the people who are independents or other people that are, uh, you know, actively involved. So this is a great, uh, I think, format or a, a method in which to do it. I was, was going to ask you, um, how, how, how are the leaders going to be so, I mean, there's three people now who would be on the board, right? And then who, who will be choosing the next board? How is the composition of the people who are running the agency going to be selected? Excuse me, I used the word agency. I meant entity. You, you mean the, uh, sir, the staff or the, I think that, uh, Matt and I have only talked about this very briefly, but I think we would seek to find staff that are credibly nonpartisan and actually more importantly, credibly expert in the area. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Deborah Plunkett couldn't be here today, but she's the former director of information assurance, so basically cybersecurity at the NSA. And she's a really important part of this triad. You know, if we're representing the parties, uh, she's representing the expertise, and I think that's where we'll really lean on her uh, to provide assistance in identifying the right talent. I didn't mean so much who the people were, but oh, it's just, the, you know, the structure, the governance structure for the future. Uh, uh, I think we have a board of five because you're going to get bigger. Or uh, so Commissioner, we, we have a board of we have a board of three. We have a we have board of three, and they can serve renewable terms. Um, and so Robbie and Matt are serving on that board along with Deborah Plunkett uh, as well. That's right. And then a vacancy gets selected by the remaining two or something like that. That's right. That's right, Commissioner. So I guess one last question for the lawyers. Um, uh, 
So assuming that we find a place where four commissioners can land, um, what comfort can you give me as exactly the kind of smart lawyers who are always looking for a way to advantage your clients um, that this will not become um, something that smart lawyers will use to try and broaden the uh, opportunities for um, undermining the corporate contribution ban. Do you want to start? Or? Well, I think, Madam Chair, I, I, th I think a couple things. Um, first, um, clearly advisory opinions limited to by their very nature, uh, the particular factual circumstances of, of each of each matter, and we and we take that very seriously. And and um, and this is clearly a unique matter, a unique proposal uh, before you. So I think that's the first point. Um, advisory opinions, by their very nature, uh, have that are self-limiting in that way. Secondly, I do think the agency over the years there has been some extra language that has been inserted into some advisory opinions to make that even more clear than it otherwise would be. Um, and uh, that that might be appropriate here. Obviously, we defer to the commissioners in terms of um, how they ultimately land in this matter. Um, you know, and I think finally, uh, you know, our focus is is trying to attack this problem. You know, and um, and get and if we do get the agency's approval uh, to get going, uh, trying to 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 provide the the, the support uh, in this area. Um, but I do think by the very nature of an advisory opinion, it is self-limiting to particular facts of our organization and the, and the activities that we're proposing to engage in. And I, I do think the commission has added extra language sometimes in these unique advisory opinions to make that clear. And, and, uh, and, and if you chose to do that in this, in this matter, obviously we would respect that. Want to add anything, Mr. Elias? I mean, I don't have anything brilliant to add to that. Um, I, it's not a, it may be that I am, um, I'm less creative than. Oh, that's not my experience with you, Mr. Elias. <laughs> it's hard for me to see, this, this, this advisory opinion doesn't seem like it's opening much in that direction. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure I know where, where one would go with it if one was trying to build this into a broader loophole. I just have sometimes been surprised in the past where I, these things As I went. said, you know, I... <laughs> Can I we up a question? Would, would, is there something in, that you have in mind, Madam Chair, that you're concerned about, something in particular? Because I have the same sentiment and have on this AO, you know, it's, it's already cabined in, in, you know, significantly. I would want to be careful, uh, Mr. Toner suggested other language Reiterating that, I, I would agree to something, but not something that mm -hmm. contradicts the statute, which says other people that are similarly situated can mm -hmm. can rely on this. So I won't do anything that, that that violates that, and I'm not suggesting that Mr. Toner is suggesting to do so. But do you have something in particular that you're concerned about? I'm wondering all this time if there's a case in your mind or there's a situation that you're particularly concerned about? No, just a long history of things that seem reasonable at the time, and then somebody else comes along and says, aha, now that they've said that, I can do this. And then, you know, it gets to an enforcement context, and lo and behold, there aren't four votes to uh, do anything about it. You know, it's just a, nothing, in, nothing in particular, just years of experience. And I think, Madam Chair, I think one, one reason we were comfortable holding, you know, having an extension of time to the next open meeting is if commissioners uh, support a, a draft of, with new language, we obviously would want to have time to, to carefully look at that and, and potentially provide comments because we have to evaluate whether uh, whatever the draft might um, indicate, whether it, it would be feasible for us to operate consistent with the draft. And so we wanted to have the ability to offer those comments if that would be helpful. And, and we would want you to have that opportunity. <clears throat> that, that brings me to, I, I assume we all agree to put whatever draft, consensus draft we're able to come up with on the public record Absolutely. as soon as possible, you know, with the hopes of, if not today, then or, or tomorrow, or early next week. I'm, I'm hoping we can commit to that. As soon as possible. Okay. And then that would provide um, the requesters an opportunity to comment, you know, publicly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and perhaps if they say we're great with it, 
we could approve it on a tally vote, and that would also mean that they wouldn't have to, uh, some of you or all of you wouldn't have to come back to the next public meeting, obviously. That, that's a possibility. I would want to make sure that we had it out on the public record long enough, not only for uh, the requesters to comment, but anybody else who wanted to weigh in on it. Okay, well, uh, hearing no other uh, comments or questions, uh, we will hold this over till the next meeting with the goal of trying to find a place that four commissioners can land. <laughs> and I thank you all very much for, um, for all of your time and your thought and um, uh, for your efforts to, to solve a very serious problem. And can I thank all of you for uh, your time and attention and thoughtful questions and comments and also uh, to the, I've been in the situation of being the next requester in line, so I also wanna, I also wanna thank uh, the next requesters for their patience and allowing. Now maybe we should have done you guys last. Well, I didn't offer that. <laughs> <laughs> I offered thanks. <laughs> Oh, and, and Madam Chair, we really appreciate also having a chance for you to hear from, from Matt and Robbie. We thought that was really important. We know that takes additional time, but we appreciate the consideration and the opportunity for our clients to be here today. I, I appreciate it also. I appreciate your coming. It's been extremely helpful to, to have this discussion. Thank you. Robbie and I just also want to thank Mark and Michael's teams. Uh, you know, we talked about how we're lightweight. We're actually not lightweight. We're no weight because they put so much time and effort into this, and we wouldn't get the opportunity to be here uh, to speak before you if they hadn't put the time in. So thank you. And I noticed that in the spirit of bipartisanship, you've got Michael's associate sitting next to Mark and Mark's associate sitting next to Michael. We lay it on or are you partners? I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody. Thank anyway, thank, thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, we appreciate the patience of uh, the other requesters. The next item on the agenda is Draft Advisory Opinion 2019-04, Prittany LLC by Jeffrey Harden Esquire. Are you Mr. Harden? Good morning. Welcome. We will begin you okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we will begin with a presentation by Mr. Paulson of the uh, General Counsel's Office. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Weintraub. Good morning, Commissioners. Before you is Agenda Document 19-13-A, a draft advisory opinion to a request from Prittany LLC, which has developed an online contribution processing platform that enables users to make contributions to principal campaign committees and national political party committees. The requester asked several questions regarding, whether, regarding the applicability of the act and commission regulations to its activity. The draft concludes that both the provision of contribution processing services by Prittany to individual users and enrolled political committees, as well as the provision of social networking services to enrolled political committees, do not result in contributions by Prittany to the recipient committees, because Prittany satisf satisfies the criteria to qualify as a commercial vendor. Specifically, Prittany renders its services in the ordinary course of business and at the usual and normal charge for such services. It forwards contributions to political com committees through segregated accounts, and it employs adequate screening procedures to ensure that it is not forwarding illegal contributions. The draft further concludes that because Prittany will be acting as a commercial fundraising firm, it is not subject to any of the reporting requirements under the Act. Finally, the draft concludes that Prittany's practices, as described in the request, comply with the applicable forwarding requirements. We did not receive any comments on the request or this draft. Thank you, and I would be happy to address any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Do we have any comments, questions? Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't have any uh, real questions or comments, but since we have counsel here, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity, if you have any, uh, questions or comments uh, of the commission at this time? Or Particularly since you've waited around yeah, this long. <laughs> is there anything that, uh, that that you want to speak to with respect to this draft that the commission? Well, thank you for the opportunity and, you know, thank you for your consideration of the request you know, and, and for the tutorial this morning on some uh, FEC legal matters. Found very interesting as a lawyer, so the, the, the time spent listening to that debate was 
was interesting to me. Uh, the one thing I did want to say is, is thank you to the staff of the uh, Office of the General Counsel. They're very helpful. I'm not an FEC lawyer, and so their guidance about the process, explanation of the issues or concerns they had, and the, uh, the feedback that they gave about my client's business proposition was very well received. So I really appreciate the help. Well, thank you. And I'm always glad to uh, hear confirmation from the outside of what we see every day on the inside, that we have really excellent people working uh, in the Office of General Counsel. Any further questions? Or perhaps we have a motion, Mr. Vice Chairman. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. In, draft, in consideration of Draft Advisory Opinion 2019-04, uh, brought by Prittany LLC, I move approval of agenda document number 19-13-A, which we've otherwise known as Draft A. Vice Chairman has moved approval of agenda document 19-13-A, an answer to uh, Prittany LLC. That will become uh, Advisory Opinion 2019-04, should it be approved. Are there any questions or discussion on the motion? If not, I will call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you, very much. you you obviously were incredibly persuasive. <laughs> well, we tried hard to fall, you know, four square within past precedent with the guidance from the general counsel staff and it got was achieved. We we appreciate getting an easy one sometimes. So thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Draft Advisory Opinion 2019-06, Lee Brown by Jessica Johnson and Jason Torchinsky. Welcome, Council. And uh, we'll begin with a presentation by Ms. Waldstriker of our Council's office. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Weintraub. Good morning, Commissioners. It's still morning. It um, is. <laughs> <laughs> agenda documents 19-14-A and 19-14-B are alternative draft responses to an advisory opinion request submitted by Lee Brown. Brown is a candidate in the upcoming special election for North Carolina's 9th Congressional District, for which the electioneering communications period will begin on April 14th. Lee Brown and Associates is a for-profit real estate business incorporated in North Carolina. Brown has recorded radio ads for the business that identify her by name but make no reference to her candidacy. The request asks whether these existing ads may be exempted from the definition of electioneering communication, or if not, whether proposed alternate versions of the ads would be electioneering <coughs> communications. Draft A concludes that the existing versions of the ads are not entitled to an exemption from the definition because they are not plainly and unquestionably not related to the election. Draft B concludes that the existing versions of the ads are entitled to an exemption because they do not promote, support, attack, or oppose any candidate, and they are plainly and unquestionably not related to the election. Both drafts conclude that the alternate versions of the ads would not be electioneering communications because they do not contain unambiguous references to a clearly identified federal candidate. We did not receive any comments on the request or on the draft, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Excuse me, Madam Chair, is your mic on? Oh, it says it's green. Is it not on? I hear you now. Oh, okay. <sighs> Brand new, fancy building, but sometimes the technology doesn't always work. Um, I'm substantially in agreement with draft A, although with respect to the um, alternative versions of the ads, I'm not, I'm not really persuaded that changing it to Lee Brown and Associates with, when the ads are voiced by the same uh, individual who has been voicing ads uh, for her <coughs> eponymous company um, for 13 years. Um, that adding the word and associates really makes it substantially different from the analysis um, uh, and changing the I to we, I guess, in the text of the ad uh, makes it substantially um, different from uh, the analysis under question uh, one. So I think even the alternative versions um, are 
would fall under the electioneering communications provision. However, if somebody else voiced the ad with the same text as in the alternative version, I think that would that would move it a step further away from the candidate, and um, that would satisfy me. Um, so that's um, that's where I am. I think it's. Uh, uh, different from the Darrow precedent, which I guess is the closest precedent, uh, because there were actually two Russ Darrows. <laughs> and the candidate was not, in fact, the uh, the guy that was running the company at that point, or had been for a good decade. Um, so I think it's close, but not, not quite analogous. So that's uh, where I am. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in on this. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. One of the drafts came in late um, and may have not given you an uh, adequate opportunity to uh, formulate a comment. Just wanted to give you an opportunity to comment on on the late draft and just any other observations that you have uh, regarding uh, the, the competing drafts and their answers to your questions. Th thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, Obviously, our client would be happy with either draft. We prefer draft B, um, but if draft B didn't have enough votes, then we would support draft A. With respect to the chair's comments about the alternative version, I think the notion of the unidentified voice of a candidate was addressed squarely by the district court in Eastern District of Virginia and Hispanic Leadership Fund, VFEC, where the court concluded the unidentified voice of Barack Obama did not constitute an electionary communication. Here, when the voice says, we're Lee Brown and Associates, we're doing the following, we'd like to be your realtor. Um, there's nobody, that doesn't identify that voice as Lee Brown. And I think that the Eastern District of Virginia has already addressed that and ruled that the unidentified voice of a candidate, unless there is essentially overwhelming evidence that everybody knows that voice, um, is just not a clearly identified voice. In fact, um, at the Hispanic Leadership Fund v. Eastern District of uh, the FEC argument, um, I actually was the, the lead counsel on that case, um, when Mr. Nodi, who was arguing for the commission, got up and, and said to the judge, Your Honor, everybody knows the president's voice. The judge's response was, I don't. And, and basically said, look, unless you can show me that everybody knows that person's voice, it's not a clearly identified candidate unless the radio voice identifies them. And so for that reason, I think the commission is compelled to conclude that the alternatives are not electioneering communications, at least in accordance with the judgment against the commission in Hispanic Leadership Fund. So I would urge you to reread that opinion before you rule, but I'd also ask you to rule very quickly because we may be in a position of needing to seek a TRO. The electionary communications window opens on Sunday, and if our client doesn't know what ads they can run for their business, we may need to go to court very quickly. And if there's, if there's one way to discourage business owners from running for Congress, this is a way to do it. To say, if you have a business that happens to share your name, a name that you chose before you even decided, long before you decided you were going to run for Congress, and you need to stop advertising on broadcast when you, or, or you have to totally change your, your advertising schemes when you run for Congress, that discourages people from running for Congress. And I don't think that's what Congress intended when they passed this statute. Madam Chair, if I just... Feel free, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the facts is presented in this case um, where we know that the format that uh, is proposed to be used going into the uh, election and communications windows is the same format uh, in terms of wording and in terms of structure as she's used for 13 plus years uh, in terms of the kind of the catchphrases and uh, identifying issues that are of, uh, of importance in the real estate market, I guess in the Charlotte area. Um, and to me that addressed the concern that if someone wanted to use their company and then all of a sudden um, changed radically the, the focus of the ads and, and that they were these hey geographic um, ads about the, the founder of the company and at the very end, oh yeah, and, and get your real estate services provided by Lee Brown. I think that we might be in a bit of a different circumstance. Um, that's a different question for a different day, but um, the evidence we have for us here is that we had a particular format with a particular individual um, and that there's nothing, there's no, we don't have any evidence that they are in any way being manipulated or changed in order to elevate um, 
her candidacy in any sort of maybe unspoken or 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 unsubtle way. Um, and for me, that was what was persuasive in uh, in wanting to put out draft B. Um, that's the reason why I'm, I'm willing to support uh, both the current uh, proposal as well as the alternate versions. Um, I had hoped that we would at least be able to land on the alternates, but uh, I just wanted to express where, where my thinking is and, and why I'm, I'm prepared to support draft B. Mr. Hunter. I too am uh, prepared to support draft B for the same reasons that the vice chair explained. And I agree with Mr. Torchinsky that if, if this is something that the commission's not able to agree, at least in part on, it will, it, discourage people from running for political office. And I think that's a really valid concern. We have facts here, as have been explained, um, somebody who ran a business for many years before they decided to run for a candidacy, and now they're not allowed to, to operate their business. It just seems completely, it, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And as is described in the draft, there, we do have the ability to to state that somebody doesn't meet the electioneering, an ex, electioneering communication requirement because of various factors. And these, to me, are, are squarely presented in both draft A and draft B. And uh, I'm willing to support either of them if we can garner four votes. Commissioner Walther. I'll support draft A. That's three. I mean, I, it, it, you know, one thing that maybe I could offer a little compromise, uh, Madam Chair, that might that might satisfy you. I think there was some language in draft B that sort of discussed how the facts of this situation were unique and, and may not be broadly applicable. I wonder if there's a way to pull some of the language from draft, some of that language from draft B into draft A, where, where we talk about the fact that sort of in the alternative version, that this is sort of a unique circumstance, right? It's not every business owner that has regularly voiced their own radio ads for a decade plus. And that's, I think, what makes this a, a little unique. And perhaps we can pull, in fact, that language is at. And while Jason finds that, if I might, I think you know part of those unique facts um, are the fact that she has been doing this for 13 years. But these particular advertisements that we included, she she wrote these advertisements and recorded them prior to becoming a candidate. So the, I mean, they truly have had nothing you know to do with her candidacy since the inception in her brain, it's quite remarkable. She actually sits down and just speaks them um, and has for all of this time. But she went to great lengths to find um, a completely separate vendor you know, in the political space to handle her campaign that has nothing to do with any sort of production um, or, frankly, anything to do with her real estate business at all. So I do think the facts are quite unique here in that I think that when the commission has considered this previously with respect to the Mark Wayne Mullen advertisements, I think there the commission felt like there had been some intertwining with respect to the issues and the vendors, whereas here she um, always ends her ads with a tagline that says, you know, I'm interviewing for a job, I want to be a realtor. There's a difference when you call Lee Brown. If we were to use instead, as Jason suggested, Lee Brown and Associates, which was approved um, or is suggested in the draft A alternative, um, I feel like that would perhaps provide um, some of those unique circumstances that the commission could prove. Right. Uh, the language that I was thinking about in draft B appears uh, on page eight at line three. Under the factual circumstances presented in the request, including that the ads do not promote or support Brown's candidacy or attack or oppose her opponents, and that Lee Brown and Associates has been distributing similar ads for the past 13 years, the commission concludes it should exercise its discretion. But I'm, I'm not saying that last sentence that begins on, on or that continues on to line six, but just the, the stressing of the unique facts if you're going to adopt draft A but approve the alternative version of the ad stressing that it's they're unique because they don't you know promote or support the candidacy they don't attack opponents and because of the long history of the of the same ads and then again on page 9 um, in line 17, the court, the, or not the court, the commission, the commission's draft again stresses uh, the unique facts here. And I think I'm wondering, Madam Chair, if bringing some of that language into draft A in proposing and in, in approving the alternative in these unique circumstances, particularly in light of the Hispanic Leadership Fund decision, uh, whether that might satisfy any concerns you would have. I hear what you're saying, Mr. Turchinsky. Um and I appreciate the fact that it does not appear that these ads were ginned up for her business in order to promote her candidacy. But the flip side of that is that 
the fact that she's been recording these ads for her own company that bears her own name for 13 years, to me, makes it a lot more likely that people actually will associate her name with her. The language in uh, in the draft on the non-alternative version that says, Brown's statement in her own voice that I'm Lee Brown is an unambiguous reference to a clearly identified candidate. I have a hard time seeing the strong distinction in saying Brown's statement in her own, own voice that we're Lee Brown and Associates is legally all that different from the first one. I, I mean, I, I understand you had a, a, I think you came out the opposite of where the court came out in Hispanic Leadership Fund. Familiar but I with think the Hispanic Leadership the, Fund decision, Mr. Torchinsky. I remember it well. Right. But I, I think the court already, I mean, I hear your concern, but I think the court disagreed with you and said, unless you have proof, all you have is a suspicion that because this voice has been associated with this real estate company, that everybody knows that that's Lee Brown, the candidate for Congress, I think is a leap that you can't make. If a federal judge in Alexandria, Virginia, couldn't identify the voice of President Obama, then why would the average listener in North Carolina be able to identify a particular voice and say, oh, that's the voice of the realtor who also happens to be a candidate for Congress? I mean, that's even more of a leap than everybody in Alexandria, Virginia knows the president's voice. Um, and I think you, you're, you're taking a leap that you don't have a factual basis to take when you, when you say that. Thanks for your opinion, Mr. Torchinsky. As I said, if somebody else, I don't know what that noise is. Oh, it's the construction it's across the way, or somebody window, washing our windows. The window cleaning. Oh, window washers. Sorry about that. Um, always a little disconcerting when you see, look out the window on a high floor and see a person out there. Um, as I said, if it were uh, somebody else's voice, I think that would that would solve the problem for me. But that's that's where I am. Sorry, I missed that because I, I was talking with Peterson. What was the last thing you said? And something would solve the problem for you? Yeah, if it were somebody else's voice. I mean, it's Lee Brown and Associates, so presumably there's somebody else who works for this company. If somebody else were recording the ad and said, we're Lee Brown and Associates, then that would... But why wouldn't that be an electionary and communication under your theory just because somebody else is saying it? It still has, her, it still has the candidate's name in it. The, the question is whether the voice in the context of the ad uh, constitutes a, a reference to a clearly identified candidate. And it only does if it's the person talking? In this context where this individual has been voicing ads for her company that has her name for 13 years, yeah, I think so. But if Peterson said it, it wouldn't reference a clearly identified candidate? I think that would provide uh, if if... Commissioner Peterson wanted to do ads for the company. That would be odd. But uh, if, uh, if presumably it would be somebody else who works for the company who would say, we're Lee Brown and Associates, then, yeah, then I would, I would view that as a reference to the company and not the candidate. I, I get it. You don't agree with yeah. me, but that's just... I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to understand the, the, the difference. What, what's the difference? In a footnote that says uh, what the facts are here, but uh, um, a different person, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe we can't make headway on that issue. It doesn't sound like it is. But, uh, but I agree. How can, how can we expect everybody to know who that is, even if the name uh, it could be a different name? Uh, and the same, you know, different, same, peers, same, uh, same name, different person. Uh, it could be the father or the son, it could be, you know, so I think uh, it's kind of unrealistic to. I mean, when, when Jimmy Johns ran ads and had a Bill Clinton impersonator acting like it was Bill Clinton's voice, I mean, it's what's the where's the where's the factual distinction? I mean, would the average viewer know that that was an impersonator and not Bill Clinton's voice? I mean, when you when you start to get to. You know, you're, you're making decisions on you're making First Amendment based decisions Jones. based on on what someone's voice sounds like, um, and and assuming that people know who's speaking. I mean, you're you're really drawing a line that I don't think that Congress intended here.
I mean, if her daughter read the read the, the the script and her daughter's voice happens to sound a lot like hers, is that problematic? I mean, how different does the voice have to sound from the voice of the candidate in order for an alternative voice to read the same ad and it be okay? And I don't think that just saying, oh, well, somebody else who works for the business, what if their voices sound really similar? Is that also problematic? And who's determining whose voice sounds similar? I mean, I, I think y you start to ask a lot of, of a candidate to decide, oh, well, I'm going to choose, you know, Jane because her voice doesn't sound like mine. But if I choose Donna, her voice sounds too much like mine. Y you know, I, I think you're really drawing a fine line that isn't authorized by, by the statute or by the First Amendment there. Well, actually, Mr. Chorchinsky, you're the one who's coming up with uh, uh, the examples. I have a nice bright line rule for you. Have somebody else do the ad. I'm not asking what the other person's voice sounds like or whether they might kind of sound like the candidate's voice. Mr. Vice Chairman? Commissioner Hunter? Would that be useful to you to have an AO that says if somebody else reads it, I mean, I'd, I'd rather not have to vote for that because I don't agree with it, but. Could we have just a minute to, to consult? We might need to actually call the client and ask. So could we take maybe a, a 10 minute recess? Sure. Thank you. 10 minute recess. Okay, uh, we're back. Uh, Mr. Torchinski, do you? Have you had a chance to confer with your client? Um, our client is unfortunately uh, at a funeral at the moment, and we oh, can't reach her. Um, so given that, we would ask that the commission uh, vote on draft A so that we can uh, decide whether we're proceeding to court this afternoon. Any, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman? I'm, I'm going to make my um, motion on draft B to begin, and then uh, perhaps we'll have an, another motion to see if uh, uh, it gets us closer to consensus. If, so um, in consideration of draft advisory opinion 2019-06, uh, submitted by Lee Brown, I move approval of agenda document number 19-14-B, the document we've been referring to as draft B. Thank you. The vice chairman has moved approval of draft B of uh, advisory opinion 2019-06, submitted by um, Lee Brown as set forth in agenda document number 19-14-B. Any discussion on the question? If not, I will call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion fails two to two with the vice chairman and uh, Commissioner Hunter voting, voting in favor and Commissioner Walther and me voting against. Mr. Vice Chairman. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in the interest of trying to see if um, there's a little more consensus, I would like to make a motion on, with respect to draft A um, on questions two and three, which address the um, alternatives proposed by the requester. Okay, so I understand the motion to be you move approval of the answers to questions two and three in draft a. Which is agenda document number 19-14-A. 19-14-A. Um, is there any discussion on that motion? I'll just say for myself that I, um, I view these facts as distinct from the Hispanic Leadership Fund precedent, which involved eight words by the president uh, in the president's voice and no mention of his name whatsoever, which uh, I believe is fairly distinct from an entire paragraph uh, in the voice of the candidate who identifies herself uh, with the name of the agency, which is her name. Uh, so that's why I will not be able to support the motion.
fur. Ready? Okay, we're back. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Vice Chair. I may. I made a motion before we uh, went into recess. Um, I was consulting with uh, Commissioner Walther, um, and what I am going to do is I'm going to withdraw the motion that I made so that he can make a motion first, and then after that, then I'll subsequently reintroduce the motion that I uh, that I made before we had the recess. Commissioner Walther. Are you withdrawn? Already? Yes, yes, he has withdrawn his motion and I turned it over. Approve uh, draft uh, AO uh, uh, 2019 06 Brown draft A. Okay, Commissioner Walther has uh, moved approval of draft A of advisory opinion 2019 06 as set forth in agenda document 19 14 A. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? I'll just say that um, I am not going to support the motion. I would support an alternative that um, concluded that the proposed altern alternate ads would not be electioneering communications um, uh, if voiced by someone other than the candidate. Uh, but that is not the motion on the table. Uh, so I will call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, all opposed? No. No? no. Motion fails by a vote of one to three, with Commissioner Walther voting in favor and um, the Vice Chairman, Commissioner Hunter, and me voting against. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll once again uh, make a motion to approve uh, the answers in draft A uh, to uh, the answers to questions two and three as set forth in agenda document number 19-14-B, known as draft B, and we are in consideration of draft advisory opinion 2019-06. Draft B. Did I say, did I say, oh, I meant to say draft A. I apologize. Okay. Yes, I, draft A. I thought that's what you meant. Okay. To be cool, yeah. Agenda document number 19-14, draft A. So okay. Uh, the vice chairman has moved approval of the answers to questions two and three as set forth in draft A, agenda document number 19-14-A. Any discussion on the motion? I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion fails by a vote of three to one with uh, Commissioner Walther, the vice chairman, and Commissioner Hunter voting in favor and me voting against. Anybody want to make any other motions? Um, I've uh, indicated my views. I'm not going to ask someone else to make a motion on my behalf, but I think my, um, uh, my views are clear if they are uh, helpful to the requester. I'm sorry we were unable to provide the guidance that she seeks. Um, I just have one request. Is there any way we could get our closeout letter uh, this afternoon so that we can go to court before the election communications window starts this weekend? Can we do that, Council? Uh, yeah, we can, we, uh, certainly we can do so. We will uh, certainly accommodate that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Staff Director, do we have any management or administrative matters? Madam Chair, we have no such matters. Okay, in that case, the open meeting is adjourned.